Welcome back, everybody, to the Construction Corner podcast. Uh, I'm Matt, and you get me alone today. No Dylan. He's out traveling. But in our effort to bring you guys pretty kick-ass guests uh, every week, we are, we are not stopping the show. So with me today, I want to introduce uh, my good friend, Dale Keynes. Dale uh, grew up in Newfoundland, Canada in 2000, then he moved all the way across the damn continent to Alberta. He spent the first 15 years of his working life uh, throughout the oil and gas industry, land development, real estate construction, real estate investment, and now is the owner of Future to Now Consulting, a firm focused on small to medium-sized businesses and building systems and processes, which I have a feeling we will probably touch on today. Dale, welcome to the show, man. Thank you very much. It's uh, good to be here and uh, good to talk to uh, some more Arte uh, people that I that I continue to meet on a regular basis. I started uh, I started 22 off saying that I was going to get on more podcasts and start to be a little bit more open about my story and my background and, and how I can start to help uh, other small businesses and medium size or any, I mean, any really any business. I, uh, I started this whole thing years, five years ago when I, I got tired of being an employee. So I jumped in to my own business. I mean, I was I was in a lot of debt when I started uh, because I, I just had enough working for really you know less than ideal bosses or managers. Um, yeah, so that's that's how that's the brief of how it started. So by all means, let's let's get into it. Yeah, I think that's a that's a real similar story to a lot of uh, us folks in RTA, which is why we're we're taking over the world. <laughs> so I'm glad to have you on, man. Uh, I'm also glad because. Dylan and I typically will, will kind of bullshit back and forth about the weather. You know, he lives in California where it's, it's beautiful most of the time. And I'm here in Detroit area in Michigan and it, and it sucks, but I finally get to say that I have a guest on who's coming from a colder, nastier land than, than me. So <laughs> glad to have you here for that reason too. Yeah. It's um, you know, people, when I, when I post my pictures, when I'm out on, uh, out on my outdoor walks every day, uh, you know, Andy, Andy got that started, I don't know, three years ago or whatever it was 18. I forget now it's been so many years, but uh, I still do an outdoor uh, walk slash run every day, and I always get a chuckle out of my American friends when when I post my pictures and I say it's minus forty five, because it, that's when Celsius and Fahrenheit start to meet is around that minus forty mark, right? So, uh, <laughs> so I don't have to worry about conversions or anything like that. I just like no, no, we're we're equal now, right? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thankfully, it's, thankfully it's a little bit warmer now, but it, you know, it's still still chilly. I mean, we're still in February. Winter's typically not over here until end of March ish. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. We're about the same on, on timeline. However, we're not, we're not nearly that gold, so yeah. <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So Dale, let's, let's start off with, uh, with your background. You kind of touched in a lot of different industries. It sounds like, um, obviously we're a construction focused show and most of the industries that I, I sped off on your, your intro there kind of revolve at least in some fashion around construction. So why don't you walk us through a bit on, on where you got your start and, and how you got to the consulting where you are now. I, I know you mentioned not liking to work for, for other people, and, and I can second that, that uh, sentiment, but let's hear a bit about, about your actual history and your background. Sure, yeah. Um, so I graduated, graduated high school in 95, uh, 44 now, and then I finished an engineering diploma in Newfoundland. And I came to Alberta because it was in geology, that diploma that I took. So Alberta was the kind of the giving, uh, the giving place to come because of its oil, because of the oil and gas. Right. Okay. So when I got here and, and got into it, um, you know, I spent my time at Fort McMurray, which is, you know, the Northern oil sands of Alberta. I spent two or three years up there, I believe it was. And then when I came out of it, I didn't want to do geology anymore. So I went into geotechnical and structural engineering for land development and real estate, that kind of thing. So somewhere along the line in 2006, I actually started a part-time uh, business of my own. The engineering company that I worked for, it was the longest company I'd ever worked, worked at as, as an employee. The owner wanted to start building homes and he knew that I, that's how I put like, cause you know, we had talked, I mean, when I started that, that engineering company, we were a small company and, you know, 10 employees or something. So anyway, you get to know the owner quite well. Yeah. And he asked me, you know, through conversation, he, he came to find out that that's how I put myself through high school. I put myself through high school and college, basically, you know, uh, renovations, roofing, windows, that kind of thing. Because my uncle was a carpenter. So he, you know, at 13 years old, I started getting into the bad stuff. 
And my uncle basically <laughs> said, well, if you're going to do that, then you're going to work too. Right. So, it, you know, my uncle's just looking out for me, make sure if I, if I drop out of school that I've actually got something to fall back on. So sure. anyway, so in 2006, I started this part-time uh, consulting company again, where I built homes for investors. So I never had the money myself to invest. Uh, so I went and basically took a fee and started building these homes for investors because that's when the market was going up. Well, all of a sudden that, you know, that came to a screeching halt in 08, like everybody right on both sides of the border. So, uh, so that company continued on. I mean, I've, I, I still have it today. Um, you know, so, I mean, I guess I did start it. I did start my entrepreneurial stuff in 2006 and, and I've always kept it there, but, um, after, after that, I, I continued on in construction. I, I was a, um, I was a general manager of a renovations and custom homes company for a few years. We went from, you know, 1 million to $4 million a year in a, in a span of about a year and a half. And I had to get out of that because the owner was, he had just kind of, how do I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure how to explain this, but he, he was at an age where he was always used to doing one and a half to $2 million a year. So when we got to $4 million a year, he kind of panicked. Right. He was like, you know, I don't know if I really want this and that kind of thing. So again, at some point, maybe we'll talk about this as well, but that, that kind of leads to the journey about sometimes you'll make just as much profit at $2 million a year as you will at five, right. Or yeah. four or whatever it is. <laughs> so that, that's kind of what was happening with us a little bit. Uh, of course we were making a little bit more than that, obviously, but he, he was just getting nervous, right. He just didn't, he didn't like the idea of, of being that, that, um, not not hands-on with every single project so he was a little bit confused on the growth aspect right and then from there i moved into uh government for a couple of years uh which i still i still have as a consultant or a sorry a client today uh and inside of government i still i was still involved in construction basically like capital projects um you know procurement supply chain you know, that kind of thing. But I understood, you know, basically where almost all jobs originate. So I got to understand the political level. I got to understand the administration level of government. And I just, I didn't like it. I couldn't handle working because <laughs> the, the level I was at inside of government, I just, I was not a fan of politicians, not where one day you are, you know, great. And then the next day you're not worth anything. Right. So as a person that comes from construction, you know, our, our reputation is on our quality and, and the work we deliver. Right. So, and we Absolutely. typically know whether we're right or we, we typically know when we're right and we know when we're wrong. Right. And we're, and we're okay admitting both or most of us good guys are anyway. <laughs> so in government, it wasn't like that. So administration, don't get me wrong administration inside of government. I, I have the most utmost respect for, and that's why I still, have them as a client today so they still use me today for again land development construction etc right so uh so yeah anyway i mean that's the journey and then uh somewhere along the line i guess somewhere in the middle i guess to describe the theoretical portion of my life i mean i've got probably three project management certificates now uh i've got an mba that i started in 2015 and i finished it in 2019 and you know through that mba was kind of when the um, story started to evolve for myself about, you know, how this consulting company ended up coming to be. Right. So, yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a pretty cool history. Um, I never would have guessed, uh, the government consulting side of it that, uh, frankly, to me sounds terrible for the reasons that you, you mentioned, but, um, can we touch on that a little bit more? What do you actually, and, and without giving anything away that you don't want to, but what do you actually do? So land development, are they, are they coming to you when they want to build new buildings for, for advice no, I and haven't, direction? I haven't or? really touched on that right now. I handle their, um, so the, the government that I work with right now handles a lot of gravel pits. Um, you know, okay. whether we're going to buy them or we're going to get rid of them as an example, that that's one I'll use as an example. So what ends up happening is that I have to then either reclaim them get them back into order so we can either sell them or turn them back to the owner or, or whatever it may be. Right. So that's, that's where that kind of stands. And then I do offer a lot of like, you know, my MBA experience and my consulting experience about, you know, growth and strategy. Cause I mean, I know the people inside of administration that I know I've known for seven years, there's, there's a level of trust there that, you know, they come and talk to me and, you know, cause I used to be, I used to be their manager at one point and then I left <laughs> 
and then now I'm back as a consultant, right? So, you know, there's a, there's a level of respect there. And, and again, it's the, you know, it's the administration side that I have the most utmost respect for. I mean, it, it just, everything just takes so long to get through government, right? As we can all see what's happening now, right? So there's, there's the administration level and, you know, politicians t- typically tend to pick on administration quite a bit, you know, saying they're taking too long or whatever it may be. That's not the case. You know, there, there's so many levels of, of bureaucracy and hierarchy and everything else that the people have to go through and on the administration level of government. And it's just, you can't, you can't put that back on them, right? It's your system is broken. It's not, it's got nothing to do with the person that's working there. I mean, they're, they're, they are people that are trying to do a job, go to work at eight in the morning, leave at five o'clock in the afternoon or whatever they work. Right. And they're just trying to get their job done. Right. It's because they get caught up in the political landscape that, that makes it, that makes it harder for them. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it would ask me to expand on anything else you want in there, but. No, that that's interesting. And I, and I, you know, I think the, the inefficiencies in government um, obviously are not just a Canadian thing that that's uh, I think that's no matter where you're at in the, in the world. Um, you know, we don't do a lot of government construction where I'm at. We do some, some municipal work and, and even in, in lower end municipal work, you'll see that, that red tape nonsense, as I call it, where, where you're right, the, the folks that are there, you know, really just bust an ass to earn a living every day, they're doing the best they can, but, but cutting through all the crap and, and getting to approvals and getting to decisions, it's, it's painstakingly slow, usually. Yeah, correct. I mean, once it's once the project is released, and the funding is in place, it, it goes just like any other construction. project. Yep. Yeah, but it's, you know, I, I, that's what I work on in government right now is just how to, you know, once there's a once there's an initiative announced, how do you get it to the actual construction process, right? Like I've got a pro, I've got a program that I'm working on right now with, with one of the other PMs inside of government. And, you know, we're trying to get this drainage project, you know, pushed through and, and get it approved, but there's just, there's so many roadblocks between, you know, one resident wants it, the other one does or does not. And, you know, so anyway, it's just, it just, it takes forever. I mean, these projects, when they finally get released and they go to construction, I think what a lot of contractors are missing is all the work that went in behind the scenes of that thing, right? Like that drainage project, we're going on, uh, what are we in February? Uh, so we're going on two years, right? That we've basically been in planning since we've gotten approval from council to proceed with the construction project. We've been two years, right? And we're not even, yeah. we're not even, we don't even have any tenders released yet for, for construction. And we're probably another six to nine months out because we still have to go through, you know, pre-qualification and we have to still go uh, into environment, you know, and get approval from environment to, to put, to put through these projects. So there's a, there's so much that goes on in the background that, and, and don't get me wrong, it's frustrating for the administration staff too, to take this long. It's because a lot be. of, a lot of them were contractors that decided to go work for government because of, you know, uh, you know, more structured hours, uh, you know, a pension, better benefits, that kind of thing. So a lot of the, a lot of the people inside of government were, once upon a time, contractors, they just decided to take a government job because of, you know, structure, family, whatever, whatever they decided to take it for. Sure, sure. But, you know, they're not, you know, it's, um, they're, just, they're just like you and I, like, if you got contractors <laughs> that mostly listen to this, that, that's exactly who you're dealing with inside of administration. So, yeah. So let's, let's expand out of that a bit. Um, you started this consulting company. Um, you're not primarily focused on construction. It sounds like you, you can, cons- you consult for any small to medium firms. Uh, so what, what are your target or, or your preferred clientele? Or do you, do you look for governments or construction companies right. or, you know, um, who, yeah. who you target? Okay. So this has been, a, this has been a journey in itself. So it usually when is I, when I started in, when I started this consulting company, I thought that I was just going to appeal to, um, landscapers, home builders, that kind of thing. Right. I was going to help them build their systems and processes. As time has gone on, I am now dealing with, you know, digital media companies. I am dealing with uh, apparel companies. Uh, who else is out there that I got? Uh, another one's a landscaper. I mean, I do have the landscapers and stuff, obviously, through the construction process. But, um, you know, I guess I'll, 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 ba- I'll go backwards a little bit because in the NBA, uh, I took it for my own purpose. Like at that time, you know, I guess I'll start here, but because there's that debate out there about whether you go to school or not school now, right? You know, do yeah. you, do you learn from others or whatever it may be? So because of my age at 44, 
I I'm still of the mindset where you go to school to a brick and mortar school. So when I decided to take this MBA in 2015, um, that's where I was at. I didn't have, I didn't have Arte. I didn't have Lions Den, uh, you know, Ryan Stumans with Apex and, and things like that. Like maybe they were there, maybe, maybe, but I wasn't the person that was out there searching for it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, Tony Robbins, of course, but I mean, you just listen to his stuff and you're like, okay, well, what does that mean? Right. <laughs> uh, you know, anyway, you know, now, but regardless yeah. through the NBA, there was a story. The reason I'm leading some of this through the NBA, I was inside of classes with people that were in companies like myself, where there was like 10 of us, but I also had people in my, in my class that were working at Deloitte or working at IBM or, you know, some of these big, massive companies, right? I finally came to the realization that it doesn't matter the size of the company. We all face the exact same problem. It doesn't change. All that changes is the gross revenue number or the amount of staff that you're looking after or whatever it may be. And I mean, I'm, I'm talking, you know, we had people in there that were actually executives of Deloitte. So, I mean, it's, we weren't talking to some, you know, uh, we weren't talking to a, a coder or something like that. Right. You know, these are executives that are sitting in these rooms. And, and when you're having a conversation back and forth, like you and I, right now, we were all facing the exact same problem. It was just scale that changed. Sure. Right. So, you know, obviously there's a capital requirement to that. Like how much money do you need to invest and that, that kind of thing. But on a grand scale, the problems were still the same. So anyway, that's how I end up morphing from looking, uh, working with landscapers to now working with apparel companies, right? So we all face the same problem. And the number one problem that it always comes down to so far in my five years is personalities. That is the hardest thing about business so far, right? Maybe, uh, you know, uh, I won't say nothing will change, <laughs> but as of right now, the hardest part is personalities and how to, and how to implement, how to fit those personalities inside of a puzzle that ends up making money for you. Right. And then how do you reimburse back to that staff member to make sure that they're still engaged and they still want to go forward and, and that kind of thing, right? It's, it's, how do you build that? that vision inside of your company that everybody else can fit inside of, right? You know, Andy and Ed, they talk about that a lot inside of Arte. So it's, again, it's the same thing. I just learned it through an MBA and now I'm, now I'm starting to see it inside of Arte and how Andy and Ed kind of handle things. Right. So, yeah. That's interesting. And I, and I see that too um, in my own company, you know, it's, it's the human capital element, which is always the most difficult. You, you have that, that kind of coach and team mentality and, and you, you know, you mentioned that like a puzzle, but to, to, break through the psychology, right? The psychology of each individual and figure out what, what motivates them, what intrigues them, what, what makes them tick and, and figure out how to place them in the appropriate spot in your organization so that a, they can, they can excel at what they need to do, which in turn, you know, betters the company, but they also then B have to be able to, to do what they're doing with person B and person C and, and everyone else in the rest of your team. And it's, it's a constant, you know, almost, almost juggling match trying to figure out where best to put people and how best to, to use the psychology to your, to your benefit and to the benefit of your, of your team overall, I think. Yeah. Um, run personality tests to start, right? Yeah. So there's free ones out there called, what is it? 16personalities.com, I believe. Okay. Uh, there's the disc program, uh, the DISC, right? Yep. People hear yep. that about a lot. I mean, you could start there, but the one thing that, that I, I have always tried to understand about people and that engineering company that I talked about earlier, uh, you know, he taught me this and that's why I stayed with him for so long. I was with him for six years or something like that. But he said, you have to understand someone's past in order to understand how they're going to move forward to the future. Right now, obviously there's some things you have to work on with a person's past because it may be destructive to your company, but yeah. ultimately that's up to you as the leader to try and figure that out. And that, I don't, I, like inside of my consulting company, I don't, I end up dealing with, uh, not dealing, but discussing leadership through discipline. So there's the people like Jocko's of the world, right? That are just, you read his books and it's like, okay, just, just, you want to know about leadership? Go talk, go listen to Jocko, Jocko yeah. right? You know, and, and get in, get inside of his, what is it? Echelon Front or something, I believe, right? Yep. You know, get into those programs. I mean, th those guys are the, are the leaders, right? It's, um, if, if you need to learn more on leadership, I mean, my leadership basically gets built through, discipline and consistency and that kind of thing. Right. And, and building those small wins every day. And that, that's how I, 
that's how I build leadership with myself, you know, cause it's an ever, it's an evolution. And that's how I build leadership with the people around me. It's just, you have to show them through action. You can't just tell somebody you have to actually do it with them and then show them how to do it. And then you can go back to delegating or whatever it is you want to do inside of your business. Yes, completely. And <laughs> Jocko, you mentioned Jocko and, and Leif Babin. Um, first of all, Jocko may be the most terrifying human in all existence right now, but, but from a leadership perspective, I don't think you get any better than, than their, their tactics through extreme ownership and, and, you know, dichotomy of leadership. Um, they're just great guys to follow also. Yeah. The, 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 just the overall presence and look of Jocko is enough to scare you into submission versus actually doing something. Yeah. The, the man could kill you in, in probably a hundred different ways before you could blink. Right. Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> let, let's get into kind of the meat of, of what I wanted to talk about today. And that that's building systems and processes. You know, we mentioned that early on. Um, I've got my own thoughts and my own, uh, frankly, uh, inadequacies in doing this in my own company, but why don't you kind of lead us off on, you know, what is the importance of, of systematizing things and, and especially for a construction company, if, if you will, because that's who our audience primarily is. What, what are the benefits of, of actually documenting and working on building systems and processes in an organization like that? So I get, I'll, I'll ask you a question back. Why do you think you're, why did you bring up the word inadequacies in your own system? Like why, why do you believe that's in place? Um, well, I know why it's in place and it's, it's because we've been complacent and, and lazy. Um, you know, so we, who's complacent? Uh, well, from the extreme ownership side, I am, I'm, I'm yeah. the, the leader of the company. So it, yeah. it all starts with me and, and I've been, been lax on that. That's, that's actually one of my, my rocks, my goals for, for this first quarter is to initiate a process where we actually start documenting and, and writing these things so that we can hopefully formalize the process and, and formalize it for, you know, we're, we're growing a growing company right now. There's six of us four years ago, there was two of us. Uh, and, and we're on a trajectory where we're going to be bringing new people in. So I see the benefit of, of keeping things standardized. You know, my, my business partner and I, uh, we, we constantly butt heads on, on things that I take very seriously and he may not things like file struck file naming conventions and structures where, where certain things go in, in a project. And, you know, there's just a litany of small examples like that, that, that I could touch on, but you know, it, it's one of those things too, that, you know, like a lot of goals, like a lot of uh, resolutions, they're real easy to push to the side because we're too damn busy. And, and that that's where I take the ownership of it. That's where I've let it slip on my own. I've let the, you know, the growing revenue, the increasing number of projects, the growing uh, employee headcount, I let those things kind of take a higher priority than what I know we also need to be working on at the same time. Right. So you and your business partner, as an example, I mean, that's good that you're opposite that, that, you know, he enjoys doing one thing and you enjoy doing the other. That's a good thing, right? Sure. Because if you're trying to overstep or you're trying to do something on his behalf, uh, or her behalf. I, I think you said he, but his, um, yeah. regardless, uh, when you start to step on each other's toes, then you're going to start to run into some problems, right? So if you are true business owners, then you have to define what your role is in that business and then continue down the path and then try, just try not to trip up, of, or try not to trip up over each other. Right. And, and have a boundary in the middle that says, okay, we're going to overlap once a week, twice a week in meetings, just to kind of catch up on what each other's doing. And then you're going to move forward. Right. So you've got employees. So obviously you're not, you know, still fighting to get at a debt or find work or whatever it may be. So now is a time where you have to define those rules. So inside of systems and processes, it's all about structure. So the four things that I talk about the most are HR, number one is usually always comes up first second one strategy the other after that it's either operations or it's project management it depends on which way you want to go right excuse me so systems are a checklist right it should be like one page maybe two like front to back page so it's only one page you're printing out for whatever task it is or whatever project it is you're trying to accomplish it's got to be a checklist you know, so don't, when I, when I work with clients on operations, I get into procedure manuals. So procedure manuals now all of a sudden will include safety documents, um, you know, man, manufacturer specifications, safety, yeah. that kind of thing. Right. So don't, 
don't get systems and pro systems slash processes and uh, or what do they call um I hear that come up a lot. Standard operating procedures. I, SOPs. I hear, yeah. Yeah. I hear that a lot. Yep. So I call SOPs, I believe if, if I understand it correctly, when I hear people, it's, I basically hear systems, right? Sure. So, um, but manuals, I mean, you, I'm assuming your listeners are going to understand the difference between, you know, a, a one page system checklist and an actual operations manual. So yeah. Anyway. So when I get into HR, you know, I start talking about the structure of HR, you know, job descriptions, scorecards, performance uh, appraisals, you know, uh, rewards, how are you incentivizing people? What benefits are you providing? Uh, employee handbook. It's amazing how many companies out there don't have an actual structured handbook. What is wrong <laughs> with you guys? Like this doesn't take long, right? You know, and we've probably all already gone through five or six employee handbooks as it is. Right. But employee handbooks, depending on the state province, you know, wherever you're at, uh, it, your labor laws are different, right? Sure. You know, so, you know, employees have different rights, no matter where, depending on what state you're in. So, you know, be aware of that, obviously, but have an employee handbook so that when employees come in, they know where they stand when they come through the door, right? You know, the, the warm and fuzzy interview process. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm glad you're here type thing, but now the work's got to start. Right. So have a handbook as the, as the first day that they go through and then safety, if you're in construction is, is huge, right? Like OSHA, OSHA is pretty big, right? So absolutely. You don't want to, you don't want to mess that up. And then, you know, that, that basically covers HR. And then as, as a holistic look at HR, you have to understand, okay, where are your people, right? So there's always discontent in the market, always. So when people say I can't find staff, uh, I don't, uh, it's hard for me to swallow sometimes. But anyway, sometimes there is that. Yes, I, I agree. Not very often. But if you're good at what you do and you post it on social media and you got good reviews on Google and et cetera, et cetera, people are going to be looking to come work for you, right? So when you have a job, app, you know, job applicant come in, then all of a sudden you can sell them on that kind of stuff. And that's going to make them want to come with you. Anyway, that's not, that's trying to understand your external market and where people are coming from and, and who do you need, right? Then we get into once the interview is over and they actually come into the company. Well, now we're talking about how are they going to stay at the company? And then at some point, however that works, they have to leave the company. Now, what does that mean? Right? Did they pass away? Did you fire them? Did they quit? you know, whatever it may be. So, you know, one thing I've understood that anything in business is that everybody's replaceable, right? As, as many companies as I've left in the past, I, you know, there's, you know, there's that, you know, as I got older now, I understand this, but I, you know, I, when I left, I'm like, you guys are not going to make it right. You know, so <laughs> you kind of, you kind of chuckle when you walk out of the door and all of a sudden you look back six months, you're like, Oh shit, they're still there. Right. So yeah, right. anyway, so my point being is that you're always replaceable. So don't think that you're bigger than something else because it's just, they, they will, they will replace you and they'll continue on. Right. Unless they decide to just close and whatever. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, it's um, anyway, that's HR. So strategy uh, touch on a little bit because it's strategy. You get pretty deep on it. Right. But, sure. um, you go into core values and vision mission statement, you know, what are your competitors doing if that applies to you? Uh, and then how are you formulating what you're doing as a business in order to proceed forward? Right. So once you've understood the HR component and you've got the proper people in place, well, now all of a sudden you can move forward into strategy, right? Not, a, not really a whole lot to worry about inside a strategy. If you, if you're still struggling inside of HR, Right. Cause you got it. You got to develop a structure. You got to develop some people to, in order to get ready to go to the strategy level and decide what you're going to do next. And you brought that up earlier is that, you know, you're trying to basically what you and your business uh, partner are trying to figure out is how do I go from reactive to proactive? Right. Those, those are the two words you're trying to figure out as a business yourself. Exactly. And then that's, and then once you figure out the HR component and who you can trust and they've been around for a while, well, now you can start delegating tasks. Then you business owners, you guys can start working on what's your strategy, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's the beauty of technology. We, uh, we are right in the middle of, of discussing strategy. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't, 
normally I'll see a notification saying, yo, your internet is, is lacking or something, but I didn't, I didn't get anything. So it just cut out all of a sudden. So anyway, um, so operations is, you know, just figure out the basics about where, where are people, where's your supply chain? What's your procurement? What contracts do you have in place? You know, don't do anything on a handshake anymore. I mean, sure. We all still want to believe in people and believe people are true, but put it in writing. You know, when you, when you're, if you got a project manager in place, if you're sending out, you know, if you're doing a bunch of phone calls, make sure you back that up with emails, right? That's, that's kind of the operations component because operations is what's going to make you money. And that's, and you want to make sure that that's looked after. Uh, and then project management is, is pretty, again, I'll, I'll, I'll try and summarize project management because it's just, you're just trying to get a project has a beginning and has an end. That's the definition of a project. Uh, like a business is not a project that's, you know, that's infinite. That just keeps going. Whereas sure. if you're taking on a renovation, it has a beginning and an end. That's a project. So, and inside of that, you're looking at the, you know, triple constraint uh, triangle that they identify inside of project management, time, quality, cost, schedule, that kind of thing. Right. Yep. Uh, and now all of a sudden you're getting into risk monitoring. I mean, that, that's the, actually, before I get the risk, one of the other things is to identify who the stakeholders are inside of that company or inside of that project. So that could be banks, accountants, lawyers, owners like yourself, uh, staff, sub trades, whatever it may be. So, uh, and then once you've identified who the stakeholders are, you've identified the scope, you know, and the triple constraint. Now the biggest thing to worry about is your risk, right? What's your risk inside of each thing you're doing inside of that project. And can you mitigate it? Can you get rid of it? You know, do you make it less impactful or is there a way around it? You have to write change orders inside of construction, all that kind of stuff, right? And then you just, and then you close out. But, you know, one of my biggest thing, I mean, I'm up to, I don't know how many freaking homes have I built? <laughs> a thousand? I got to be over a thousand homes I've built by now. Okay. Uh, I've done probably 500 renovations. And then I've had 12 to 15 of my own homes that I've uh, built, renovated, you know, sold, whatever it is. So the hardest thing about construction, and I, I mean, I've been on billion dollar industrial expansions in, in Fort McMurray, and the hardest thing about construction is the last 10%, right? I call it that Achilles heel of construction, and it's it's that last 10%, and it's just a nightmare sometimes, and you just got to put all your resources that you can towards it to try and solve that problem, because it's just, it, it can turn sideways on you, and then all of a sudden, you're losing all your profit, and yeah, it's just, anyway, um, that's, you know, project management summed up real quick so those are the four anyway that i deal with hr strategy operations and project management so I, that's what my consulting company is based on and everything i do is inside of the experience that i have i don't give any advice i don't believe in that as a consultant to give someone advice i give them the experience that i've actually lived through if i can't give you the answer i will send you to another to another business or wherever you're going to try and solve whatever problem you're after it's just, I, I don't need that on my conscience. And when I go to sleep at night, I know that I know that I've done everything I probably could have that day. And that's, that's about where I leave it. So, yeah. Well, and that, and that's why you're doing well is because you've actually lived it. You've had these experiences, you know, there's a lot of self-help gurus and, and quote unquote coaches out there. There's maybe they're not more now than ever, but more that I ever have seen now. Uh, and, and most of them have never done a damn thing in their entire existence. So, mm. you know, to, to come from a level of experience like you have, you know, building 1500 some odd homes, that's, that's pretty impressive for, yeah, for I mean, don't, don't get me standards. wrong. I mean, some of the, one of the, like one of the companies I worked for, we went into like, that sounds like a lot of homes, but I guess it is, but, um, <laughs> you know, we went into, we had basically a subdivision knocked out, right. Sure. So we went in there with like, you know, 300 lots. And just banged out the houses. Like you just, you literally went down the street, like, you know, foundation, oh, yeah. foundation, but you know, you, and you just set up all your trades and you went right. Sure. I even had, con I even had it contracted out where I had project managers contracted out to me to, to look after the freaking day to day. Right. If, if, <laughs> you know, if your listeners are familiar with familiar with home building, can you imagine having 300 homes, right. Just oh, yeah. lined up like one after another, like that's, that's just a logistical nightmare. Right. Absolutely. You know, it is windows and doors and tubs and yeah. It's so, you know, lumber packages and windows and oh my goodness. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, that's the constant struggle in construction is, is managing. I mean, we talked about managing people in the very beginning when you're talking about that, that scale and, and that, you know, tracked home building style. Yeah. The, the number of people on your team that you're managing is, is huge. And if, and if you let one slip, you know, it's, it's the domino effect and it'll, it'll come screeching to a halt, everything behind it. And, you know, you're out of luck at that point, right? It is, you know, it is huge, but I mean, if, if you got to have a level of trust in, in the people that you've got there, right. 
So if you've got no level of trust and you're just starting, like, let, let's pretend you're one year in business and you're just starting out at this thing and you all of a sudden you pick up 300 track homes, which is probably highly unlikely. Um, but if you, if you do by some stroke of imagination, um, uh, you're going to suffer immense pain, right? You know, you'll, so uh, it's, you'll uh, learn yeah. <laughs> the universe, well, the universe has a way of teaching you real fast. You'll learn and hopefully you don't lose all the capital invested. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Dale, what would, uh, what would your favorite tip that you give to, to leaders be? Do you have a, a favorite leadership or management tip that you, you like to leave with folks? Lead We've by, got a, a lot of people in our audience that are, are similar to, to us. They're business owners um, in and around the construction industry with, you know, employees ranging from, you know, a couple to a couple hundred. Yeah. Lead by, lead by experience. You know, we, we touched on that and we talked back and forth is just, you know, lead by experience and lead by action. Right. It's, you know, if, if we're talking about a leadership component, that'd be the biggest thing. And then after that, as a company, make sure you got some rules set in place. And I, you know, the, the word that the theoretical term for that is governance. So governance is the term that's used that owners have created as a path forward for staff. Right. And then now all of a sudden it's up to the project managers to take those rules, so to speak, and move forward with a project. So that's the managerial component is to make sure that you've, you know, you don't have a bunch of owners that are wishy-washy and they're changing their mind day to day. And, you know, one day it's this next day, it's that, but that's, that's just so hard to do. And yourself as a business owner, I mean, you guys got to be prepared for that. And that's why the discussions need to happen in the backgrounds between you and your business partner about, okay, how are we making this path forward? Because the more unorganized we appear just causes even more culture problems down the line. So you're at six employees, I think you said, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's now's the time to get that under control and find out how to reimburse your staff better so that they stick around for the long term and they don't end up become competitors of yours, right? So, you know, you might have to, obviously there's, there's going to be a point where you're probably going to end up taking less money than, than your staff members are, but there's a reason for that. You know, it's, uh, it's all about growth and scalability and, and that kind of thing. Now, if you're, I've got a client right now that's, that's on the path of selling their business as well. So they're, they're on a different path where they're trying to reduce overhead and increase, you know, the, the labor portion, because that's the profitability side so that they can show better numbers. Right. So, sure. You know, but, but I mean, overall, most people get into business because they want to be their own boss and they don't, you know, right now they may not be thinking about selling their business, so to speak. Right. And in construction, I, I don't, I don't hear of a lot of construction companies selling their business because most people are just like, well, I'll just go start my own. Why do I need to buy yours for? Right. <laughs> you know, cause I mean, well, I mean, like when I was running that renovations company, I mean, you know, projects come and go and then they stop. And typically that client doesn't come back for five to 10 years. Yeah. And that, and that's just it. There's not a there's not a whole lot of asset management in a construction company on, on the GC side, especially, you know, the subcontractors yeah. are a different story. You you've got, you've got capital at, and you've got assets, equipment, all these things, those have a tangible value. Um, but, but to your point, yeah, to, to sell a, a general contracting firm um, it's not impossible by any means, but it, it's tough because a lot of these firms, once the, the leader is out of the picture, the firm's fizzles, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's so much relationship capital that it, you can't replace with a dollar value. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a journey, man. So it's um, yeah. So Dale, we're, we're coming up on time here, but I'm going to ask you a, a question. We ask almost every guest we have on um, and it's a two pronged attack here. So the, the question is, what do you see as the biggest problem in, in, in our industry as a whole? Uh, and the second prong is, what do we do about it to fix it? Because we, we're big on, on finding problems here and, and providing solutions at the same time. Oh, man. You know, my mind, we started talking about this at the beginning before we even got on the air. And, you know, the biggest problem that I see right now is government. You know, it's just there's, there's a lot of corruption out there on, on both sides of the border, you know, Canada and the U.S., Absolutely, there is. And, you know, right now that that appears to me to be the biggest problem. Um, because, you know, without, without freedom that we're all used to, then, then where do we where do we stand? And what are we even working towards anyway, right? If we're going to end up giving it back to someone else. I mean, you know, like Canada right now, where they're freezing bank accounts, as an example, right? It's just like, like, how do you, 
how do you, how do you deal with that? Right. You know, so if, if we don't have the buy-in from the politicians that, you know, that we're supposed to elect and that are supposed to serve our best interest, then, you know, where do you go from there? You know, that, that's, that's the number one problem for sure. The second one is why I started this uh, consulting company. And that's, you know, business owners have got to be better and they've got to be more aware of the staff that are around them. And what I mean by that is I was one of those employees that sat in an office. I was, you know, I've had jobs right from labor all the way to C-suite executive positions. And, you know, no one ever teaches you the questions that you're supposed to ask as a staff member, right? You know, so I've, I've got a book coming out. And, and I hope that book addresses a lot of the tactical information that, that, will, that will cross off those, you know, dot those I's and cross those T's. But a lot of employees don't even know what questions they need to be asking, like about strategy and, you know, what's our path and what's the vision and what's the core values and, you know, how do I even ask for a raise or, or I've never had a performance appraisal done before or anything like that. And, and a lot of owners, if they get stuck for too long inside of that proactive reactive stage, they lose a lot of the staff that should still be there. Right. You know, you've probably got instances in your mind that you've gone through that you've lost staff members or you've been working for other companies and lost people. And you're like, we should have never lost that person. Oh yeah. Right. So, you know, that, that's the, that's the biggest issue that I see right now is that, you know, a lot of employees just don't, they're, they're lost. And a lot of owners don't really direct them on, on where to go because they're more interested in making profit and selling their business than they are looking after that staff member. Not everybody, but I mean, you know, I spent 15 years as an employee and I mean, that's, that was pretty much the resounding theme the whole time, right. For 15 years. And I was a two year employee, right. After one year, I, you know, I would, I'd, I'd, uh, you know, I'd, I'd do my best and work for a year. And then next thing you know, I'm like, okay, well now where, where am I going? What am I doing? So sure. You know, and then I would ask the questions, but I mean, those questions never got answered. So then I'm like, okay, well, I'm wasting my time, time to leave. So, you know, the one company that I did stay at the longest, like I said, they always answered those questions until finally got to a point where I was like, okay, well, I need more than this. I need, you know, ownership or shares or something. And they just, they're like, no, not happening. So I was like, okay, well then I got to go find something else. So anyway, that's, those are the two things, I guess, to, um, uh, to say that I, that I see as a challenge right now. And how do you fix it? Government, man. Um, you just <laughs> got to say something. You, you know, that, that's the biggest thing. You just got to say something. You just can't sit there and expect that these, these politicians that you pay for with your tax dollars are just going to fix it, right? You know, I, I've, uh, I won't speak on the American side, but on the Canadian side, I mean, the, the politicians that are in place right now, and it's not just one party. It's just not liberals or conservatives. They're all corrupt. Right. Cause I, I've done the history and I've done the research and I've gone back as much as I can with the time that I have to find out that the corruption is there. It exists. If you dig for it, it's there. You'll, you'll find it. And you just got to speak up. And when you've had enough, you just got to say, okay, I've had enough. Right. And that goes, and I guess that kind of goes into solving the second problem that I brought up as a staff member and an owner, you just got to decide when enough is enough. When is the pain too much? And when are you going to say something or when are you going to quit or whatever it may be? You know, for you, you and your business uh, business partner, same thing, right? You guys will get to a breaking point where you're like, okay, something's not working. We're we're fighting each other, and we just got to fix this if we if we believe in the in the mission and the vision and where we're going with all of this, right? So if we have more time, I'm sure we could pick that apart too if you want it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, anyway, it's uh, yeah, I I hope that's a, a broad enough but tactical enough answer to uh, to answer any questions. I mean, I, I guess I hit up on you know, four of the pillars that I go through in, inside of consulting to, yeah. uh, to help with the tactic piece as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, hopefully leaving, uh, I hope I left with some tactics that people could take and not just another, you know, um, you know, rah, rah, uh, Tony Robbins speech, so to speak. So I don't mean to pick on Tony, but Tony. No, awesome. no, I think you did well. And I think you did leave some, some tactical uh, nuggets Good. here for everybody to kind of to gain and, and learn from. And, you know, I, I agree with your sentiment wholeheartedly, first of all, about the, the issues in government. And it's not just uh, relegated to the Canadian side by any means. But, you know, at the end of the day, it almost it breaks down to really simple errors and lack of communication. Right. And, it, and it's it's us as people not standing up and communicating what we want. It's it's politicians not communicating what they're really doing. You know, there, there's all kinds of things going on here and, and we're not going to solve it today by any means. But, 
Yeah, I mean, like you, know, you look at you and I, I mean, we're separated by 3,000 miles and a, a, a country border, right? But yeah. what you want, what I want are the exact same thing, right? Absolutely. Sure, there's some discrepancies in there as well. But I mean, it, there has to be that that's what makes that's what makes democracy democracy, right? You're not always supposed to agree with somebody. So yeah, it's, uh, it's that's the that's the simple of it, man, we all want the same stuff. You know, it doesn't matter if you're left, right, middle, far left far right you know it's it's all the same thing well maybe maybe not if we go to the far left and right but you know what i mean 80 I, I to 90 percent of us all want the same stuff yeah I, I think most of us are all more centrally leaning than than people realize and you know f- freedom ain't free that's for sure but you got it but that's what we all want man yeah yeah, yeah my grandparents uh my grandparents fought in the war and you know I, I fully intend on not being the generation that lets that freedom go away um, you know, after I'm gone and my kids, you know, my kids have to, uh, you know, take, take the torch, so to speak, then if, if it's on them, it's on them, but I don't, I don't intend on letting it slip through me. So, yeah. Once you lose it, I, I don't know if we'll ever get it back if we lose it. So I, I'm there with you. We, we no, got Andy, uh, Andy's, Andy's stories on Instagram right now are spot on. This is, you know, this yeah. is the chance right now. I think if, if this slips away and politicians get away with whatever they're trying to do, uh, I, I think it'll be a very hard struggle to try and get it back. So it's, uh, like I, like we were talking about before the air. I mean, I was sitting here six, three to six months ago saying, I don't understand how Australia got to where it is. And here we are in Canada, right? I mean, if you watch the lives today, it was February, Friday, February 18th, right? Uh, 2022. If you watch the lives in Ottawa right now, it's, it's happening here now too. What was happening in, in Australia? So yeah, just, you know, as, as a friendly reminder to, uh, to my American friends, as I've got lots of them now. <laughs> It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's very close to you now. So be aware. It, it really is. And I appreciate the sentiment. I hope everybody listening is, uh, is of the same and, and, you know, we all need to work together to fix these things, whether it's problems in business problems in, in government problems in our livelihoods, you know, we, we no. touched on a, a lot today and yeah, that, yeah, that's good. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, and people ask me, they're like, well, who's going to solve these problems? You know, my, my answer always is entrepreneurs right? Our job as entrepreneurs are to be resourceful and to use the resources around us to solve a problem, right? That's, that's why we got into business, right? And at the end of the day, we pay their wages, we pay the politicians, we pay for the roads, we pay for the bridges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How we get out of this is through entrepreneurial spirit, right? That's what we all got in. That's, that's why we're in the countries we're in. And that's why we started what we started right? Is that we're looking for that next level. And that's, and that's how we get through the whole thing. I mean, politicians eventually have to listen to the voters and have to listen to the money. So yeah. Awesome. You got, you got it, brother. I, I can't even add to that one. That's perfectly <laughs> stated, man. Dale, how can people find you? Uh, just go to my website, future to now and uh, you can find my links from there. So there's no point in uh, trying to go through all my Instagram handles and all that kind of stuff. You'll, you'll find it through that website. And I, and I do, uh, I am, I am working with a company out of Utah that's helping with my helping me with my SEO and stuff like that. So I'll be uploading a lot more content uh, in the coming days and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, and if you do want to find me personally, once you go to my website, it'll take you to my business pages, and then you can find me from there as well. If you want to go to my personal, you know, my personal pages and that kind of thing, I, I'm always up for a discussion. I'm I'm over arguing with people. Right. It's like that part of my life is done. I left high school freaking 27 years ago. Like that's, that's done with me. So if you're coming for an argument, you're picking on the wrong person. I don't care what you do. I'm about to do what I'm doing. So you go ahead and do you because I'm going to do me. <laughs> David Goggins, right? There you, you know, go. That's, that's one thing I've learned from that man here recently. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love it. Guys, future to now consulting.com. Check them out, link up with Dale. And, and he said he's got a book coming out. So We'll be keeping a close eye on that and uh, maybe get you back on once you, once you're ready to release it. Yeah, absolutely, man. Let me know. Dale, I appreciate it. And guys, that is this episode of the construction corner podcast. We will catch you next week.